So relying on active carbon will help you a whole lot. Cover crops, I mean, is there anybody here that doesn't think cover crops are, are important? Do I have to convince anybody? I didn't think I would, right? Yeah. I, they're just, they're really key. They're our easiest way to build up our soil organic matter. Weeds are probably the number one problem for most growers. If you cover crop extensively and religiously, way less weeds. I'm looking as I sit here at an outbreak of buttercup. <laughs> and it's because we didn't put another cover crop in after we harvested. Because we were going to get right back in there and plant. And Diane, my partner, always accuses me of doing this. I always tell people, make sure you never leave your soil bare. But then I go, oh, we're going to get in there in a little while. And then it rains a lot and other projects come up and we don't. And what happens, you have an outbreak of buttercup. If you had sown a cover crop in there, if we had, the buttercup would still be a little weed, struggling to make a few flowers. Instead of this big, massive, wonderful bloom of yellow. <laughs> which is buttercup, you know. Nothing anybody wants, you know. Um, so the cover crops have many, many advantages, but for us right now, it's just to have maximum uh, soil active carbon, and then that you know helps you to ace your fertility if you use a soil test um, and learn to use whatever amendments you need, and that's where the classes coming up in June can really help. But also, we always have classes like that at every grower school. And extension can also help you with that. Sometimes they're better with organic amendments. Sometimes they're not as good with organic amendments. You got to find the right person. Okay, and then the final thing is drainage. Um, you can really set yourself up for disease if you have, you know, anaerobic soils because the whole fertility system shuts down. And indeed, some some of the soil-borne diseases prefer that wet soil. You can solve that most easily usually with raised beds. I can tell you that we have a classic situation where we can't easily solve it and what we're going to be doing is bringing in a bunch of pond silt and raising the lower end of our garden because the way it drains there's no place for the water to go so it just sits in this low spot and we really can't do drainage that's, that's sustainable in that we we cannot set up our drainage so it can run directly into the stream that is not okay you have to set up drainage so it drains across a, a nice, a nice buffer zone, at least mm -hmm. 25 feet, preferably 50 to 100 feet, mm -hmm. right? So that all the nutrients, which you know, are going to come out of a garden that we that we treat like we do, right? Are not washing into that stream. You know, that's just not not something we can do. Much as it would be very convenient, we just can't do it. When we get our heavy downpours and stuff, there's going to be some leaching. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I mean, systems overload. You know, yeah. and that's I mean, and indeed. Streams wouldn't have fish if systems didn't overload because they need some of those nutrients, yeah, you know. Yeah. A certain amount is due to come in, you know. Yeah. But you don't want to straight pipe a whole lot, you know, oh. from a concentrated area, oh. you know. And then we also do amendments, amendments sometimes. We can't control the rain, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. So we have something, you know, flushing down when we don't want it to, you know. We do compost tea app app applications with fish. Yeah. And, you know, I think we got enough life that not as much would come through. But I just don't think we want to have you know that going that you know directly into a stream. Um, but what we can do is raise our beds up, get them high enough that it'll stay wet down low, and the roots just won't go down in that anaerobic area. You know? mm -hmm. And so that's that's the only solution we have for this garden here. Sometimes you can do drainage, but really pay attention to how you're doing it. You know, pay attention to the rest of your ecosystem, and don't you know set it up so you're get, having you know strong flow from your garden into a, a body of water. Um, and those are the, the cultural practices you can do as far as, you know, the beginning most basic stuff, you know. Um, then you want to pay attention to when you're planting and where you're growing to sunlight. You know, and I don't know how many times I, when I did the radio show, we would see that the problem the person had, why their plants were ill, or why they were doing low production was because they're trying to grow them in a the forest. You know. Many, many, many home gardens are, have so many trees around them that they're suitable for shiitake mushrooms and hostas, which are edible, by the way. You know, but they just don't really suit garden vegetables. Garden vegetables are, by and large, prairie vegetables or edge vegetables, vegetables that grew on the edges of forest, not in forest. You know, So you just have to have five to six hours of sunlight before you want to think about growing vegetables. You know, I, mean, I say that, but I always tell people, well, I try, I try, you never know. You know? You might have more sunlight than you think. You know, you might get some bounce off of a roof or something. Who knows? And so, I don't say don't try it, but really, if you expect success, five to six hours is pretty darn important. Yeah. And for things like tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, squash, you really need closer to eight to really do well. You'll get something with six, but it won't be very satisfying. Yeah. 
Um, but that's just the beginning of thinking about the sun. Uh, you know, just jump a little ahead in the handout. Um, last year, we just wanted the tomatoes out. You know, and we decided where they were going, but we hadn't thought about, well, should we pay attention to where varieties go? And it was just like, a, get the tomatoes in the ground, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we want another row in before we leave, you know. And so we just slammed the tomatoes in, you know. And then we looked at them growing, and we realized that there's that tree right out there that leans over the garden. We cut some branches back, but that nice big maple there with the many um, trunks coming off it, it shades that end of the garden a lot in the afternoon. Now we've cut some branches off it, we're probably going to cut some more. But still, it means that, you know, the tomatoes are getting enough sun in high summer. They're getting their eight hours because the sun's up, you know, and strong enough to do something by seven, you know, and they've got sun by three, you know. But come three o'clock, they're going into the shade, you know. They're getting in the shade, they're staying in the shade. And indeed, one little patch right by the tree is in the shade probably by one o'clock. And had we had Defiant, which is a very disease-resistant tomato plant there, it may not have ever had a problem. But we had Brandywine. Brandywine tastes great, but it has no disease-resistant package whatsoever. <laughs> it is utterly disease-prone. You know, it's put all of its energy into flavor, and that's what you get. You have to trade off, you know. You, don't, you rarely get a tomato that can resist every disease and then taste spectacular, too. You know? tasted the Defiant, but I can't see it. Yeah. How is it? If it's dead, dead right, it's quite good. And that the, the genetics that originally were used in that came from, I'm pretty sure, from Randy Gardner. They give um, creed, they give credit to uh, NC State because Randy was retired. But the genetics came from Randy. And I learned over time that that was his trick. I mean, I thought, God, these tomatoes are, used to joke that they were resistant to appetite. But they were really designed to travel well and then ripen completely. And I really got it completely when I talked to a farmer, I don't remember his last name, but his name is Billy, up in Anty County. He grows a lot of tomatoes and he grows Randy's varieties. And I said, yeah, you know, I guess it's, they got to be dead right. He said, Pat, the better retailers I sell to have the box sitting in the back and they watch the box and when the first one rots, that's when they put the rest out. Yeah. And then they taste great. We're growing it for the first time this year, so I wonder yeah. how they... Dead ripe. Okay. Dead ripe before that. Okay. But dead ripe, pretty respectable. Okay. Pretty respectable, and we brought in, you know, it's going to be, I'm going to use this example a lot because it, it fits into what to do and not do. We brought in early blight that started, I mean, I say, can't, shouldn't say brought in. It again is endemic, it's here, you know, we got it, you know. But we allowed it to go into the outbreak stage by having those brandy wines over there. We had a period, I think it was in July, when it got really wet and cool. A lot of days, and early blight was showing up, little spots here and there, and we were spraying. And we missed one day of spraying, and the next day, because it was raining, we couldn't spray. The next day, that row was just so blighted. And after that, all it was just ketchup all the time. We kept our tomato crop going, but we didn't have as good a production, and flavor wasn't as good because we had so much early blight pressure. And early blight is controllable. If you spray enough, you can control it, you know. We actually use copper and serenade, which I rarely use for early blight. Um, we'll talk about that more when we get into talking about sprays, but, um, you yeah, know, with, with spraying probably four or five times a week until we had it, until we got into a hot dry period and it died way back, you know, we had that problem. And we'll talk more about um, that, about those diseases when we get to sanitation and things like that, because there are things you can do, which we did actually, you know, I mean, I guess, you know, now that I mentioned, we got new stakes last year. And if we, when we finish with our steaks, because we like to use it more than one year, we oxidate them. Because early blight can live on the steaks. Early blight can live in your pots, it can lose in your, lose in your soil. Oxidate meaning burn? Oxidate does burn and oxidizes, but it's a product. Okay. And when we talk about sprays, we'll talk about it. Um, the problem is going to be that if you're growing on a very small scale, you have to cooperate to have some of these sprays. Because you do not want to spend 150 <laughs> bucks on that much oxidate. But if you buy it together and trust the warnings and wear gloves and put it in containers that you can then bring home that can allow it to vent if it needs to, it's fine to break it up, you know, and divide it up and it's it's a great product to have, but how many people here are gonna spend hundred and fifty bucks on a pesticide? Yeah, okay. Are you a farmer? Yeah. Doing small scale. Yeah, let's see you will. Farmers do, home gardeners don't, you know. Um, and a lot of those are now available in home garden in home gardener size. 
but um, yeah, you want to oxidate. It's one of the tools you need. Yeah, you got. You're definitely gonna want it. You mean um, at the end of the season? Pardon? To clean all your clean. Yeah, clean it off. Yeah, um, and then mulching. We'll get. We're gonna cover that again. You know, it's in the handout. But it, the, we didn't get that. Yeah, you know, we had early blight on. If you don't mulch and haven't used basic sanitation stuff with things like brandy wine, it'll start showing up before it's even flowering. You know, I mean, it's just like. You know, it hits them fast, you know, just depending on the weather, you know. So, Pat, if I'm not certified organic and I want to do something practical and I have my <clears throat> area that I'm going to have tomatoes climbing on again for the second straight year, would it be practical for me to make a 1 to 10 solution for oxygen? Absolutely, yeah. 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 I'd love to get you to oxidate because, of course, the clocks isn't good for you or the environment. Yeah. You know? Right. And so we should talk because we can probably get you some oxygen. Okay. You know? sure. Is oxidate hydrogen peroxide? It is hydrogen dioxide. Oh. It's very similar. Is it the yeah. same kind as purple plus? No. Is that water? water? No. It's not. Pardon? How is that not water? Hydrogen dioxide? I oh, wait. H2O is two hydrogen. Right. So it's HO2. <laughs> yeah. And um, it's stabilized with acetic acid. It smells like vinegar. Um, and it's organic certified. Organically certified and take it seriously. Until you dilute it, it is dangerous stuff. Um, I thought that one of our um, employees knew about it. He didn't know about it. He was handling the undiluted stuff and I had to have him rinse his hands for half an hour. Because um, I've ever spilled it on my hand, you know, even though I was trying not to. You get a little white spot and then the skin starts coming off there. His layers, the outer layers of skin were just slopping off. I mean, he didn't get down to any wounds or anything, you know. But he was freaking me out, you know. Uh, and that was a big lesson to me to make sure that everybody's trained in it. So you use chemical gloves or whatever? It's good to use gloves, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not, you know, it's, I, I think it would even get through a regular glove unless you really saturate it, you know. Um, which you really want to treat this in a way where that's not going to happen. You know? But and you don't want to get it in your eyes, that's for sure. You know, you want to, in general, when you're using sprays, believe all the warnings. Do everything they say. And a great lesson to me on that was years and years ago, way back, about probably 1986, I went to one of the early Carolina Farm Stewardship Conferences. It was in, in a college. In those days, we didn't, even, we didn't have to have great big hotels and stuff. And the integrated pest management expert for the state was giving a talk. And he showed the whole soup for you know, disease, you know, for, for spraying. And I said, if I'm organic, I don't need to use that. So it depends where you spray. I said, about the only thing I spray is BT. He's like, oh, you don't need to use that. And all of a sudden, this pesticide watch activist who had been fired by the EPA sued, won, and used the money to start a pesticide watch group. Um, his first name is Eric. I forget his last name. Started talking real loud in the back of the room. I kept looking back at him. Why are you being so rude, right? I got outside. I said, why are you being so rude? He said, I'm sorry, man. I got so mad when he said you didn't have to wear protection when you used BT. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I don't know what's in there now, but do you know, you can never tell what's in the inerts. And they used to put asbestos in the inerts in BT. Because it probably stuck really good. <laughs> it probably stuck into the animal, you know. And the BT got injected because it's got those nice, you know, stick. Plus, they needed to get rid of it, you know. <laughs> and that's been, that, was a, that was a whistleblower article in the Express years ago that 60 Minutes looked at but then didn't pick up. But this woman, Andrea, this really great reporter they used to have, I might have been Green Line before it was even the Express. Um, she she had a, a EPA whistleblower who said, "Yeah, they use pesticides to dump uh, hazardous waste." Thanks. So, what do you much. recommend for uh, protective gear when you're spraying? Um, get a respirator. Mm -hmm. Wear long sleeves. Wear gloves. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, you know. It's gonna be fun in July. What they say. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, a Tyvek outfit. I've worn one in July. And, yeah, it's uh, no fun it at all. Just wait. Yeah. yeah. Just wait. Yeah. It's no fun at all. I don't know that you need Tyvek. For the kinds of sprays we're using, it's, I like ty the Tyvek outfits because I'm in shorts and short sleeves. I didn't remember long pants and long sleeves, you know. But here I tend to try and just have something to throw on. You know? And I will confess that I give this advice, but sometimes don't take it. Um, but that is not smart, you know, if you don't want to do that because you, even though things like serenade, bacillus subtilis, right? That's what it should be. But the nature of pesticide companies is that they're, um, they're, pr they're proprietary. You know, it's a trademark thing. You know, now if it's Omri approved, you know that we have an organization that has no financial interest 
in selling you pesticides and has a great interest, right, a mission in making sure that organic farmers have things that they can use and meet national organic program standards, if it's OMRI approved, then you know that they think it's pretty darn safe. That still doesn't mean that you shouldn't use the protection, you know. Um, Did you say you wear, do wear a tie back? I ever have, yeah. Here I tend to, I live right close to here when I'm working, so I can just go grab a shirt and long pants. But I also just confess that sometimes I don't bother because I'm in a big hurry, you know. And I should, you know. I don't think that's good practice, you know. Um, and, you know, I don't recommend it. I recommend that you read the, read the label and follow it completely. You use respirator a lot of the time? I use a respirator almost always. Face covering? Yeah, and you know, you just don't worry about what I'd like to do is find somebody clean shaven to do it because obviously it's a lot harder for somebody with a beard. Yeah. I also, we use a, a backpack blower sprayer uh -huh. and we also pay attention to that rule which is you don't spray when there's a wind that can make it drift. So if I'm spraying where it settles and I don't walk too fast, then I can stay out of the great bulk of it. But I'm not fooling myself that there aren't atomized particles that are still coming down when I'm walking through there. Do you use the steel blower? I use, we have a steel that we haven't used yet. We just bought it used, but we also have a saw. Solo blower? Yeah. 